We have been talking about love and the complexities of that because uh, we have so many definitions of love and we love so many things. And sometimes, as we said, if people love an ice cream, they love their dog and they love their mum, and I hope they don't mix the three together. There are five love languages from what we hear and what we know. And uh, secular writers and uh, Christian writers research that and they come up with five love languages. These are the languages where you express love to somebody else and it speaks to them in a particular way that you speak, you express. So you didn't understand what I just said. Why? Because it was in Samoan. It was in the heavenly language. <laughs> but if, if you were Samoan and if you were part of heaven, you would have understood what I just said. But no amount of saying that is going to communicate to you unless you understand. And they say that there are five love languages, and if you would find the love language of your son, your daughter, or primarily your spouse, you're going to learn to love them, and they're going to learn to love you, and you're going to live in harmony together, and uh, growing together, flooded with joy. And the love languages are gift giving. That's the first one, no, not necessarily the first as far as uh, priority is concerned, but gift giving. When you, there, there are people, if you give them a gift, it expresses your heart to them. But if the person, if that's not their love language, then you can spend all your savings giving them gifts. They'll still say, why don't you love me? And he's telling them, I've spent everything that I have giving you things. But she, they, it doesn't communicate to them. <laughs> they don't understand. The other one is physical touch. There are people who know that they are loved when you touch them, whether it's the hand or give them a hug. But it, it expresses love to them. The third one is uh, spending quality time together. You can wash the dishes if you want to. You can do the garden. You can paint the house. You can change the carpet. But if that's not their love language, you can do all that and never express to them because they don't understand. And even though out of the kindness of your heart, you want to uh, beautify your environment, if their love language is to spend quality time together, you can die trying to fix everything, and they still think you don't love them. Now, many times we express love to the other person the way we want to be loved. But that may not be what expresses love to them. There are acts of service where you do things, like we said, around the house and doing little acts that expresses love. If that's their love language, it's just amazing. And then there are words of affirmation. And they say that children, children grow up without touching, without a hug. They have no words of affirmation they'll be totally depleted of the qualities and the giftings that they need to make a success of life. I didn't make those up. Those are came from researchers, uh, Christians and non-Christians. Gift giving, physical touch, quality time, acts of service, and words of affirmation. That's probably the problem of the woman of Samaria. She's had five men married to them, but did not know how to express love to each of them. Or maybe she confused the first husband and the second husband, and now she's living together with a man, 
no longer married, doesn't even care anymore, and trying to discover the love language of this man. He's had five husbands, didn't work, now living with a sixth man, trying to make work what she could not work before. Hallelujah. Are you all right? And then she met Jesus. She met the seventh man, and she discovered something so powerful that here was a man who knows how to love. Here is a man who read her mail, and yet she was never condemned. She was able to expose her and yet cover her at the same time. Go call your husband. I've got no husband. Jesus said, yes, you've got no husband. You're right. But you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is no longer your husband. You no longer care. You're just living in sin. I'm adding to that now, you know, understand. You know. And Jesus was able to expose her, expose her heart, expose her lifestyle, and yet covers her at the same time. And even though she was exposed, there was a love that covers a multitude of sin. And even though he read her mail and told her everything that she did that was not right, yet she felt secured in the love of this amazing man. It didn't cover her up. It, didn't, it just covered while she could heal. And in one afternoon, in one discourse, in a few moments in the middle of the afternoon, she came and she found love expressed in a language that she understood and never condemned about what her life was like. It's the same with you and me. Even though if you write a picture, if you take a picture of our lives, you would not want to see it. And yet he covers, he exposes to heal without condemnation. And while he reveals, he covers. Hallelujah. And when she left, she left the well, she left her water jar behind. She came with a water jar to fetch water, and she left the water jar behind. Why? Because she didn't need the water jar. She's now got a well. <laughs> yeah. She left the water jar because she's taking a well home. She came rejected. She left accepted. She came empty. She left overflowing. She came condemned. She left pardoned. She came hopeless. She left full of hope. She did not know her need was spiritual. Yeah. And Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give to you, the water that I give to you will become in you a well, in you a fountain that will flow unto everlasting life. So she did not need the jar anymore. She got a well. She came to a well and saw a living well sitting beside a physical well. And when she left, she went back to the very people that rejected her and said to the men, now that's saying something. She spoke to the men of the city. Come see a, a man. Behold the man. Come see a man that told me everything I have ever done. Is not this the anointed king of Israel? Is not this the Christ? <coughs> Hallelujah. The love that she found was a love that made her not ashamed. She found hope. Love was poured into her heart. She came on love. She left with a, a love that bears all things, that believes all things, that hopes all things that endures all things. She left with a love 
that never ever fails. Hallelujah. Let me say something in general. Many men, when they are loved, sometimes they don't know that they are loved because a man, to love a man, you don't have to buy him gifts, you just have to respect him. If a man is respected, he knows his love. If a man is disrespected, he would rather live on the top of the house than live with a woman that doesn't respect him. Now, on the other hand, if a woman is loved, there is nothing she will not do for you. But you have to communicate it in a way that you understand. Are you all right? So the question I want to ask us, and it's probably a very absurd question. Probably I should not ask it. The question is, if there are five love languages, and it's nice if you and I learn to practice it for the harmony of our homes. <laughs> because some people get married and they spend all their lives fighting each other thinking that the spouse is an uh, epitome of the Antichrist, not knowing if they discover their love language. The question I want to ask, does Jesus have a love language? <laughs> now that's an absurd question because Jesus created all languages. He created love. He is love. There is nothing that is created that was not created by him. So why ask a question that seems on the surface to be stupid? You're asking God that created everything seen and unseen. Does God have a love language? Does Jesus have a love language? Because when you ask that, you diminish him down to just... Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Hallelujah. If he has a love language, what is it? Because if we could find that secret, then maybe we would be able to walk with God without all the problems that we carry. That we will learn to cast our burdens on him because his burden is easy and his work yoke is light. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for us. Hallelujah. We understand that Jesus became a man. He is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. He understands that we are fallen creatures. He understands the weakness of our flesh. And he's able to intercede for us because he understands our inner being. He understands our frailty. He became human. God became human. And then we find in the scriptures that Jesus had to be made perfect through the things that he suffered. He had to be taught to obey. And then you ask the question, the same absurd question like we are asking this morning. Can Jesus be taught? Can Jesus be made perfect? Does Jesus have a love language? Aren't you glad I asked your question for you? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you ever look at uh, Matthew chapter 8, Let's get to the scriptures just in case you think I don't know the Bible. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8. And we will look at something else before we look at, uh, uh, look at our question. And maybe ask another question before we ask this question. Alright? Are you alright? 
We'll ask another absurd question before we come back to our absurd question. And then so we'll ask this question before we answer our absurd question. All right. So let's have a look at uh, Matthew chapter 8. And verse 5. When Jesus had entered Caponium, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and the other one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found much greater faith, not even in Israel. The question I want to ask, and it's right here. The Bible says Jesus marveled. I want to ask you a question. Can Jesus marvel? Can Jesus who knows every, knows every molecule in your, in your body, knows every blood vessel in everybody here, knows the heart of every human being that has ever made and created, can that Jesus marvel? Can you surprise that Jesus? If he knows the beginning and the end, he's the first and the last. He knows everything and all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. If he created the stars and the planet and they tell us there are stars out there, you can put our whole solar system in it and it doesn't, it just rattles. It's like trying to fill this building one at a time, one grain of sand. Every time, no. Another grain. How long would it take to fill this building with sand if you fill the building with one grain at a time? How long? There are stars out there. You can throw the earth and our sun and the solar system we have. We can throw the solar system we live in into one of those suns and you'll be standing there almost forever trying to fill that, that star. That's the kind of God we're talking about. Can that God marvel? Now let me read this to you. Now this is what I, I preach in 2015. It's part of my message. I preach at the National Conference of the Assemblies of God. So I'm just going to read to you what I, I, I preached then. And uh, the theme of that conference was looking unto Jesus. And the point I'm making here, this is part of the message, looking unto the hills in times of need. The psalmist was looking to the hills, but his help did not come from the hills. His help came from the Lord. The psalmist then described the qualities of the power of this helper. My help comes from the Lord. How powerful, how resourceful is that helper? He made the heavens and the earth. Everything in heaven, he made. He made the heavens and the earth. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. Let's skip the reading. It says, uh, This man came for a witness to be a witness of the light, that all through him might be saved. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming to the world. Jesus is a light and he gives light to every man and every woman that comes into the world. Without Jesus, you can't see nothing. Albert Einstein discovered the law of relativity 
He did not make the law. He only discovered it. He said, and scientists still confirm it today, that everything in the universe is changing except light. Everything is changing except light is not changing. Therefore, everything is relative to light. Here is the essence of the law of relativity. When two cars pass by doing 50 miles an hour and they pass, 50, 50, they pass at 100 miles an hour. The speed of light is 187,000 miles per one second. One second, it travels 187,000 miles in one second. If I'm driving that way in the speed of light at 187,000 miles per second, and my wife, Pastor Sophia, is driving that way at 187,000 miles per second, and when we pass, the speed no longer matter. It's not the speed that you're thinking about. When we pass 187,000 miles per second, 187,000 miles per second, what happens is, at that point of passing, start, time no longer exists. Time doesn't exist. God is light. In the essence of light, there is no time. A lot of stupid people said, if God, oh, God made the heavens and the earth, who made God? There is no time in God. So stop asking a stupid question with your three-pound brain trying to find out who God is. That's the law of relativity. So what did Jesus do according to the psalmist? Made the heavens and the earth. Jesus made the spiritual world of angels and unseen beings. He made the celestial world of the sun, moon, stars, planets, solar systems, and galaxies. He made the terrestrial world of earth, mankind, and animal. He, he made the botanical world of plants, trees, flowers, herbs, and shrubs. He made the biological world of germs, amoebas, paramecia, and all microscopic matter. He made the chemical world of atoms, neutrons, protons, electrons. Jesus made all reality. The baby in Bethlehem was also the God of Genesis. Jesus created everything. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Does that Jesus marvel? Can that Jesus marvel at something? Jesus was born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty, was reared in obscurity, and only once crossed the boundary of the land in which he was born, and that was it in his childhood. In infancy, he startled the king. In boyhood, he puzzled the learned doctors. And in manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed a multitude without medicine and made no charge for his services. That is the Jesus we look to. When Jesus was born, he was the same age as his father God, yet he was older than his mother. Does that Jesus marvel? Can, can Jesus marvel? If he, that's who he is. I want to share that to give you some perspective to ask an absurd question. Does Jesus marvel? As a prophet, Jesus is one through whom God has spoken his final word to mankind. As a priest, Jesus is the one who accomplished the perfect work of redemption on Calvary. As king, Jesus has been exalted to his rightful place on the throne of God. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the architect of the church and Lord of all. He is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the initiator and completer of all that we are. Can he marvel? Can that Jesus marvel? He never wrote a book, yet all the libraries of the world cannot contain the books written about him. He never wrote a song, and he furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters put together. 
Hallelujah. He never founded a college, yet all the schools together cannot boast as many students as he. He never practiced medicine, yet he has healed more broken hearts and bodies than all the doctors combined. Jesus is the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion, and the lamb of zoology, and the harmonizer of all discourse, and the healer of all diseases. He is the Jesus we look to. Can he marvel? Can that Jesus marvel? Throughout history, great men have come and gone, yet Jesus lives on. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. He annihilated sin with the power of his blood. He wrote victory over the grave and robbed the cemeteries of its contents. And in the end, killed death, defeating death at his own game. This is the Jesus we look to. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Can that Jesus marvel? Can he be surprised? So the question we want to ask can that God marvel? And what does he marvel at? He marvels at you when you trust him because he created all that and you and I are the epitome of his creativity and when we learn to trust him are you okay? then he marvels so our absurd question this morning does Jesus have a love language? <laughs> can, we, can we diminish him down to just one love language? Is there a love language that Jesus understands? If you ever look at John 14, then I'll close because I've got three more minutes left. John 14. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I'll reveal myself to him. He that has my commandments, his word, and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. I'll go over the page. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. What is the essence that speaks your love to him? It's obedience to his word. He didn't say, if the Maoris will do this, I love the Maoris or the Samoans. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will, my father will love you. And I will love you and manifest myself to you. He that has my word and keeps it, my father will love him. And my father and I will come to him. And we're going to live together with him. But it has to do with obeying his word. Are you okay? So, John... We talked about Peter last week, I think we did, last week, Peter. John discovered that love language and decided, Jesus is going to love me more than anybody else. And Jesus did. Of all the twelve, 
of all the other disciples, of all the ones that came to the meetings, Jesus loved John. This son of thunder. Now, son of thunder is not the... I mean, he was hot-headed. But yet he discovered Jesus' love language and wrote about love more than anybody else. And while all the other disciples were doing, Jesus decided, I'm going to love him. And Jesus, uh, John decided I'm going to love him. And Jesus said, if you love me, I'll reveal myself to you. I'll ask you a question. Who wrote Revelation? I think, I think Jesus kept his part of the bargain. If you love me, I'm going to reveal myself to you. My Father and I will come and live with you. Can you imagine if we learn to do that? Can Jesus marvel? Does Jesus have a love language? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you today. You're a marvelous God. You're a wonderful Savior. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you that your love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I pray, dear God, that anyone in this room today that does not know that love, that they'll make a decision like John did. I'm going to love him because I want him to come and live with me. And I pray for those that are watching online. I pray, dear God, that you will minister, Lord God, to them. You will touch their lives and bless their hearts. If you're listening to the service, you've never made Christ the Lord of your life. Can the God that created the heavens and the earth marvel? Yes, he can through faith and trust in him. You put your own trust in yourself so many years, why don't you today put your trust in the one that created everything and created you in his image? If you want to do that, pray with me, pray out loud, so that you can hear your own voice. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you're alive. God raised you from the dead. And you are alive today. Jesus, I ask you, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. To live in me. Be Lord of my life. Be Savior of my life. Be my Redeemer, my God, and my Lord. I give you my life. I live for you the rest of my days. Help me to live in victory. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you can ring the church and let us know what you've done. 06-345-0265. And uh, we'll see that... Uh, some material is given to you and get you connected with people that will help you in your walk with faith, your walk in faith. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Have a nice cup of coffee when you get home. Amen. <laughs>